Okay, everyone. Um, Want to jump back into uh, the the lecture? Uh, we'll do this asynchronously because I have a um, I have a I'll be in DC tomorrow um, uh, with a congressman. So um, I look forward to filling you all in on that. And uh, I promise to show you some footage from that um, next class. Um, we're going to move right along. We're going to get right into the Great Depression. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I hope everybody had a nice, safe, healthy Thanksgiving um, and enjoyed their time with family, enjoyed the break that we all got. I know I needed it, and I'm sure that you all needed it as well. One of the things I want to keep coming back to, um, especially when we study history, and what I notice about a lot of your papers is that it's, it, you, you summarize. Now, summarizing doesn't really know that you know, or, 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 or um, prove that you understand it on a critical and analytical way or sense. Um, I want to start really getting us to have more of our own opinions into this. What do you think happened? Why do you think it happened that, that way? Do you agree with the author of the textbook? Or do you agree with um, my lecture? Uh, I want you to have a conversation with it. It's not just regurgitating information, regurgitating facts and dates. Um, so when we look at the First World War, right, why I said, oh, what was the cause of the First World War? And many students said the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Yes, I know. That's our inciting incident. But if we take the wider scope and, like, let's say, look at what's happening in the European world and Americas, we, we're looking at many countries going into an age of imperialism expanding beyond their continental borders, building empires, carving up uh, developing countries. And America is doing that in the Western hemisphere um, without European involvement. So we're seeing that, right? And the, the assassination is the uh, event that lets the genie out of the bottle, so to speak. But we also have the family unit, <clears throat> the uh, king, uh, the, the Tsar Alexander and King George pictured here with their cousin Kaiser Wilhelm, the family of Queen Victoria and how these ruling families are all intermarried and related. We've spoke about why the battles are so terrible, this increase in technology, guns, machine guns, radios, zeppelins, um, poisonous gas, submarines, U-boats. Um, and the tactics did not match how advanced the technology was. You know, we're, we're getting in the 20th century, one of the things that increases our ability to kill each other on a massive, massive scale. Are we becoming more humane? Um, are we becoming more intelligent, more modern? Or do, are we able to really kill a lot of people um, more efficiently? And one of the things about the First World War is that it does strike a blow at Western imperialism or Western self-confidence and optimism. The rest of the world says, look at what you guys have put yourself through. Millions of people are dying in the fields of France. So all that led to the increase in uh, the casualties. Now, when we look at the American front domestically, what's happening here is the propaganda campaign, the Committee on Public Information, headed by George Creel, picture here, movie posters, press releases, ads, the four minute men who gave the sort of speeches around the US, um, prepared by the Creel Commission, because the Wilson administration decided that patriotism was too important to leave to the private sector. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see that in, you know, uh, post 9-11 when we have the 50 yard line reunion, you know, bring out the soldier and the fatigues. Looks like he just came from the front, right? With a nice image uh, for us to believe. 
and he runs to the 50 yard line to see his family who um, they don't know that they've been brought into a football stadium and also brought out in front of 40,000 people and they see their father. Forgive me if I'm eating a little bit, a little hungry. So the, when the Lusitania sank in 1915, we look at that as when the United States gets involved in the war. We are sneaking weapons into the Allied forces. The Wilson administration is running for re-election. He runs on a campaign slogan. He kept us out of war. He changes the army's training from tropical warfare to a European front. He's building up the military. Um, he's getting the war fever going, he's beating that drum. Uh, he's using the Lusitania as justification, but it's really the Zimmerman note. The Zimmerman note sent it from Germany to Mexico to invade the United States from the Southwest to regain Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, and we're, we're, Wilson has sent in the Marines to Mexico during their civil war. So tensions high between the two of them. When the United States actually does enter the war, our forces, superior number, industrial power turns the tide. The stalemate is broken when the United States enters the war. So we don't win the war, we tip the scales. Um, I would even argue, it's an analyzing, right? Instead of summarizing, there, that if the United States chose to come on the allied, uh, the Axis power, the central powers side, it would tip the scales that way. World War I is not as good and bad as we are in World War II, right? With the Nazis killing, um, exterminating people and Italian fascism and the killing of oppositional political parties. World War One's a little bit more muddy. Uh, you know, it's kind of like gray area. It's a, it's a war between kings. <clears throat> So when the United States does get in, we do see Russia pull out of the war after the Leninist Revolution in 1917. Tsar Nicholas, uh, pictured here on the, uh, I guess, screen right. <clears throat> he and his family would be taken to Siberia where they would be killed, assassinated. Lenin would actually take over and actually uh, sign a peace treaty with uh, the other power with the central powers. Um, that would be one of the 14 points that Wilson adds. Wilson does involve the American military in the Russian Revolution. That could be one of the uh, seeds of tension that eventually grows into the Cold War. April 2nd, 1917, the US declares war on Germany. Wilson issues the 14 points that following January 1918, they establish the agenda for peace. Um, and so Wilson is greeted as a hero in France. Um, <clears throat> some of the big ones in terms of the 14 points. No more secret agreements between countries. Diplomacy should be open to the world. International seas. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll go back for that first one. No more secret agreements between countries. That's to avoid the alliances, right? These secret alliances that kind of dominoes into a worldwide crisis. Serbia declaring war on Austro-Hungarians. Serbia calling on Russia, Russia declaring war on also Hungarians, and then the Germans getting involved because they're allied, allied with also Hungary, the French, and then the English, and then eventually the Americans, and you have the war. International seas shall be free to navigate during peace and war. There shall be free trade between the countries who accept peace. Free trade in the American view is a way to avoid conflict. We look at a lot of these global international trade agreements as trade agreements where the United States is taking advantage of, let's say, a developing country or a weaker country. Now, there might be elements of that. It could be an unfair trade deal, but economic dependency prevents conflict. You in your own personal life will be less likely to tell somebody to heck off, don't want to deal you with anymore, if you're not, if they don't owe you money. You might try many ways to get that money they owe you you'll be angry, you might conjole, you might charm, you might petition, you might even say, you know what, I know you owe me a hundred bucks, why don't you pay me 50 up front and we'll charge interest on the rest. You gotta do something to work out an agreement. You are looking for a solution to the problems because your economy and, and economic well-being is, is dependent on it and vice versa. 
Uh, there shall be a worldwide reduction in weapons and armies by all countries. Um, that's really just speaking more to the acknowledgement that in the modern era, we're becoming very, very good at killing each other. Um, <clears throat> The borders of Italy will be established. A lot of the other points are just about the land disputes. Elsax, Lorraine, France will regain that. Germany will be reduced in size. Austria, Hungary will be allowed to continue as a independent country. Austria, Hungary, Hungary, sorry, I always pronounce that wrong. Um, Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania will be independent countries. Ottoman Empire, uh, Turkish people will be allowed to rule their own countries. Poland will be an independent country, and then a League of Nations will be formed that protects the independence of all countries, no matter how big or how small. Now, the U.S. Senate rejects American involvement in the League of Nations. Its argument being, we're not turning our foreign policy over to foreigners. It's a strong argument. Um, the United States come up with this idea for this international body, then we don't even join it. Um, and if, we're, if I'm analyzing why, it's probably because we did not feel the, the true effects of the First World War. If anybody has traveled in England, France, especially England, First World War really moves over. It was, it was like, it, it's a deep-seated um, pain. On the 11th day of the 11th month, at the 11th hour, November 11th, 1918, Germany will surrender. Uh, or announced that it would accept the 14 points as a meaning of armistice. Um, maybe because they thought the Germans would get favorable uh, um, terms from the Americans, given that there's a huge German population, uh, the anti-German sentiment is not that strong in America as it is in France. Um, the French would regret, uh, would, would uh, reject this, they would come up with the Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles was the most important of the peace treaties that brought World War I to an end. The treaty ended the state of war between Germany and the Allied powers. It was signed on 28th of June, 1919 in Versailles, exactly five days, five years after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which had led directly to the war. Now, it included the German guilt clause. Treaty of Versailles was much harsher against Germany than the 14 points. The treaty included a guilt clause. It blamed Germany for the war, as well as made them pay huge reparations um, that Germany owed to the Allies. This would really infuriate this man, picture here. That's Adolf Hitler. Because of the German guilt clause, because of the Treaty of Versailles, he would become radicalized. This is a picture of Adolf Hitler. And from World War I, um, he was a trench runner. He would run from trench to trench. It was actually a very dangerous job. When he rises to power, like many politicians, uh, he will um, kind of uh, not exacerbate, that's the word I'm looking for, um, extol. Exaggerate. That's my word I'm looking for. It knew it comes to me. I'm getting older these days. He would exaggerate his war experience. Um, and uh, he used that as the basis of running. But he would be one of these like really uh, veterans that come home from the war really disillusioned. It happens in defeat. We, we spoke about disillusionment to defeated armies, but the Confederacy. Now, we're not tying the Confederacy to the future Nazis. But in terms of how defeat manifests or affects people. Defeat is hard to come by. And if the terms are really harsh, which the Treaty of Versailles was, um, it can radicalize a lot of people. Now, the next era that we go into, um, it's really the era I love. I mean, the Roaring Twenties. Um, I think if anybody, you know, if everybody's asked once in their life, when would they, there's an era they would like to go back to Maybe it might be the 50s or 40s. Maybe if you're the rock and roll music, the 60s. Maybe the 60s. I've been watching that Get Back documentary about the Beatles, and um, I wouldn't mind being alive for when the Beatles were putting all that great music out. But I think I would go with the 20s. So post-World War I, America really changes. We're going to go into a party scene. We've gone from the Gilded Age, laissez-faire economics, 
to a progressive era, which was very idealistic and socially aware, social consciousness. We fight the war. America has survived. Uh, Europe is drowning in, you know, uh, destroyed industry. This is what the trenches look like. I mean, that's Western France. We're going to be building America, building New York. New York will become the center. Um, so Americans return to this like growing city, this growing lifestyle, prosperity. With the war came the suspension of moral code, more free and individual morality. Um, as people even more move more into the cities, African Americans had more dignity. Harlem Hellfires won a lot of fame in First World War. War would be one of those kind of watershed moments for a lot of people. If we tell people to go fight for the freedom of their country or the freedom of others that are oppressed, and if they're oppressed at home, when they come home, they go, how can you send me out there to fight for another person's freedom and then deny it at home? Culturally, we'll see less influence of religion, less parental authority. Women now have more independence. Um, we'll see the rise of American cities. 51% of Americans lived in urban areas. We'll see the rise of skyscrapers. We'll also see car culture really take shape. 600,000 miles of roads constructed. Um, we're going to see a whole car industry come about as Ford perfects the um, as he perfects the factory system. <clears throat> so if the 20 or if the progressive era is that era of idealism and social consciousness, the 20s is a time of materialism and hedonism. Pleasure for pleasure's sake, let's have a party. Sadly, you know, I think a lot of people were expecting the 2020s to be the same, but we got we got hit with COVID. Um, uh, now, when we think about the car culture and what, what Ford did, he perfected the assembly line. Now it takes 39 minutes to make, uh, 93 minutes to make a car. More people could own a car because Ford increased wages, but he did it for two reasons. One, he increased the wage to a living wage to avoid unionization. And two, because he wanted his own workers to buy, their pro buy his own product. What Americans do with cars and Americans' relationship to cars um, is much more the average American. The average American loves his car. It's freedom. It's like a horse. It's my car. It's my truck. It's my pickup truck. Right? The Europeans will make, for the most part, in the early car culture, cars are for the rich people. BMWs, Bentleys, Mercedes, they're for rich people. Um, even if you go to Europe today, car it's not a car culture place. But I have friends, uh, cousins, and family in Europe, in Ireland, and uh, it's not a big car thing. Like Americans like their cars big. But this also increased demand for auto-related industry and created jobs. Roads and highways needed to be built and maintained, parts stores and service stations, hotels and restaurants, and it also now the back seat becomes the place where a lot of first kisses happen. Um, it redefines lovemaking for a young generation. The conservative right will call it brothels on wheels, but um, you know, to a lot of young Americans, they'd be driving the lover's lane or lookout mountain. Well, let's go to the lake um, and listen to some music. We also see after World War I, Hollywood takes shape. After World War I, movies are now like 30 minutes long. The 1920s in movies see the development of a plot-driven story. D.W. Griffith's very controversial first feature-length film, Birth of a Nation, very racist film portraying the KKK as hero, led to a rise in increase in numbers of KKK members. If you've ever seen the very famous uh, <clears throat> disturbing images of KKK members walking through the hell, uh, streets of Washington, really from this time period, Woodrow Wilson loved the movie. 1927, we'll see The Jazz Singer, the first movie with a soundtrack or, or a sound in. And Hollywood became the movie capital of the world. We now have these new movie stars, movie celebrities. Cecil B. DeMille, Rudolph Valentino, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford. And they'll start, um, and, the, and also The Jazz Age, Louis Armstrong, the phonograph, the development of truly American music. And we'll see this coming out from the uh, from the South, World War I and wars, for the most part, bring jobs. And industrial centers were Chicago, Detroit, New York, Pittsburgh, 
Boston, Philadelphia, and African Americans in the South are oppressed and under segregation and uh, Jim Crow laws have taken full effect. You know, that it's entrenched now in the Southern society, Southern society. And so those job opportunities allow them to escape and move to the North. The 20s is also when we see time, labor, and saving devices introduced into the homes. Once only available to the rich, they're now available to the middle class. And it also gives up, frees up time and also allows people to go after leisure more. Vacuums, refrigerators, washing machines, electric irons, toasters. Uh, it is a complete shift of American life at the high gear, pleasure for pleasure's sake. The defining law of the decade will be prohibition. Um, prohibition really started in the 19th century um, during the Grant administration. Uh, <laughs> maybe Grant was a good example for temperance. Uh, you could cut back a little bit as the uh, legend goes. Um, but the movement began in the 19th century with the belief that alcohol hurt the mind and body, led users to crime, hurt people and property, sent many to the asylum, cost money, reduce worker output. Um, by the time we get to the um, fall of 1917, half of the states in the US and two thirds of the population lived in dry areas. Um, December 1917, uh, 18th Amendment passes Congress. It prohibited the manufacture, sale and transportation of intoxicating liquor. It's ratified in January of 1919. October 1919, we see the Volstead Act introduced, the law enacted uh, to provide enforcement <clears throat> for the uh, uh, 18th Amendment, um, prohibiting the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages. It passes over Wilson's veto, um, which really, uh, over, we don't see too many things pass over a presidential veto in our history. And to find anything, alcohol is anything with <clears throat> a half or 1% of alcohol in it. And it gave the Bureau of Internal Revenue the power to administer the law. Now, doctors would be exempt and also churches. So even Catholics started going to church a little bit more on Sunday morning to drink the blood of Christ. Um, obstacles to the 18th Amendment, many would be with the, you know, the, the portion, the, the tension between rural and urban. There's no suburban society yet. Really, that comes after World War II. So we're really, it's distinctly different. We have like rural people and urbanized people. And the 20s is when we see 51% of people living in urban settings. The opposition to the national prohibition in large cities, lack of cooperation between federal and local authorities, Corrupt agents took bribes, failure of the Justice and Treasury Department to centralize control, and overall disrespect for the law, kind of embodied by Al Capone. Al Capone would be the embodiment of this disrespect. Um, leads to the rise in crime. Uh, prohibition led to the rise of the mob. The mob's ability to smuggle liquor from other countries also see an increase in bootlegging and illegal consumption during this time. Um, um, <clears throat> and that brings us to the really the almost the end of the 1920s. Um, we'll go back and we'll look at some of the literature um, from F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, the women's movement, women like flappers, the women's fashion. Very very fascinating time. But the election of 1928 saw Herbert Hoover as a Republican nominee uh, running on a platform of prosperity and prohibition to keep the, you know, hands off the economy, keep the economy growing against Alfred E. Smith, who was nominated by the Democrats, who ran on a platform of individualism. Al Smith is an old school New Yorker from Tammany Hall politics from the Lower East Side. If you ever seen or heard one of those old, like, New York accents, it's Alfred E. Smith. Alfred E. Smith was an icon in New York politics. He's not too well known these days, but, um, but he was a Catholic and he was the first Catholic to run for national office. And a lot of bigotry surfaced regarding his Catholicism. We've only had two Catholic presidents, John F. Kennedy and Joseph Biden. Um, 
but Al Smith was the first and his Catholicism really held him back. Um, in terms of religious diversity in the executive office, we really have had none. Um, and so religious bigotry really surfaced in you know, the rural areas of the country against Al Smith. The vote for Al Smith was seen as a vote for the Pope because Catholics um, believe in the, um, of the holiness of the Pope, whereas Protestants do not. Now, the Great Crash of 29 is always looked at as the reason why this, the Great Depression happened, but a lot of historians are like disagreeing. They feed the 20s as also a moment where too many economic changes are happening. Domestically, land remained underdeveloped, mortgages foreclosed, banks started failing, real estate speculation. European demand for American goods is on the decline because industry started to recover from the war. Um, now, long-term causes, the cotton industry was affected by the rise of synthetic materials. The railroad industry is affected by this growing car culture and now airplanes. Passenger miles on railroads declined from 47 million in 22, uh, 1922 to 34 in 1927. Coal industry declined in the face of electric, oil, and chemical industries. We then see low food prices affecting the farm industry. We see demand from Europe drop for World War uh, American goods after World War I with their industry regaining um, solid foundation. And the government refused price supports in the 1920s. We start to see overproduction be, uh, began to be spending uh, less on goods. So consumers began to spend less on goods and we have underconsumption combined with a really restrictive immigration law of because of the Red Scare. Um, immigration laws reducing the American, not only population, but our consumer base. Immigrants are customers. And so when we think about even coming out of COVID, right? Teachable moments, what can we take? Like there's still kind of conversations um, happening regarding immigration. Um, how will that change even after COVID, after we've had, you know, this whole issue with the wall and the immigrant, the, the Southern border con conversation? You know, one of the moral arguments is, well, everybody's an immigrant. Your parents, grandparents, uh, we're all immigrants here. Um, so we should let everybody else in, but then the pushback is like, well, you know, there are economic elements to it, but you can look at immigration as affecting the economy, not only workers, but also customers. They are people that buy products and you need people to buy products to get an economy going. But we start to see our warehouses full of unsold products. Beginning of the wealth gap, we start to see about 5% of the population making 30% of the total income. This happens in laissez-faire economics. When the market is left to its own devices, people are greedy in America. I don't know how many times we have to see it. You see it during the Gilded Age, and then you see it during, uh, the, during the 1920s, and then you see it again in the 1980s where we think it's like, oh, people left to their own devices are gonna spread the wealth. Um, over half of the country, country at this time live below the poverty line. We're also potential customers. And then on the international front, yes, Europe is buying less American products because Britain's farming and industry has come back after World War I. Same with France, same with Germany. But the US protectionist trade policies really hurt foreign, foreign trade, specifically the Howley Sloot tariff, which created the highest tariff U.S. history. 23 nations retaliated by imposing tariffs on U.S. exports. Then we do get to the Great Crash. Um, the great photos of the Great Depression. Um, October 29th, 1929, everybody wanted to sell. Within hours, the stock market crashed. Um, really came from a lot of realist uh, speculation on the bull market. Uh, the market continued to rise through the 1920s. And then for investors, they're putting down little as 5% down on a stock. And they could pay back that debt if the stock went up. But in case the stock went down or really went down, they would lose all their money. And then the banks would be calling in that 95% that was you know, kind of um, purchased uh, without a guarantor behind it. Um, 
So when the when the call when the crash actually happened, when, the, when we get to the Great Depression, um, we see by the 1930s, um, 26,000 businesses failed in 1930. Those that survived cut back on investment um, and began laying off workers. And the big one, this is what Hoover will say will be the cause of the Great Depression. Germany defaults on its payment to France, which then defaulted on payment to the United States. We'll see US steel fall from 262 to $22 a share, and 25% of the American labor force could not find work. I think during COVID, we were, we were in and around 14%. Um, now the Great Depression by 32, 5,761 banks failed, 22% of all banks. 4,000 more were collapsed between 32 of December and the new president's inauguration in March of 33. Thousands of businesses failed, 20,000 in 1929, 30,000 in 1932. Business investment decreased by 95%. Uh, unemployment reached 25%, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in 32, when it was only 3.2% in 1929. The low skilled workers were affected the most. African Americans and immigrants were hit the hardest. Those are also who were not unionized and then reduced to menial work. They're also having the jobs that are lowest on the totem pole. So when, uh, when businesses were restrict, constricting, they, they were the ones that were fired first. Wages dropped due to deflation, 12 billion to 7 billion in three years. And then we see an increase of back of child labor um, people having to get their families, um, children back into the labor market. Now the human cost, many people experience a loss of self-worth. Many families broke up, marriage and birth rates declined. Families would be doubling up in homes. Three million lived as hobos in Hoovervilles. Now nutrition became rampant. Uh, depression transformed American life. People took to roads to search for work. Of mice and men is the story of the depression. Two unmarried men, there's no women in the story with John Steinbeck, two unmarried men taken to the road looking for work. 4,000 children stood in bread lines in Detroit. Shanty towns uh, sprang up all over the United States. There was one even in Central Park. But depression was the longest and most devastating in US history. The US was hit hardest among industrialized nations. Not until World War II did depression really end. Now, when we get to Hoover's response, you know, did Hoover respond too slow? Did he just re not respond too quickly? Uh, did he have too much faith in the free market? <clears throat> um, he did not respond quickly enough, or we were just playing armchair Monday morning quarterback. Hoover believed that Europe was responsible for the Great Depression and urged businesses to avoid layoff and wage cuts. He did get public programs going with the Hoover Dam. Uh, trying to get people back to work. But his response to a point is a little slow. We've seen this with presidents in office um, when a crisis hits, economic crisis. You know, uh, Hoover, Bush, W at 2008, and even to a point Trump with COVID. You know, the idea of seeing the forest from the tree, I don't know if anybody in there uh, I don't know, wildest imaginations could picture that COVID would have lasted this long. Um, but one of the things we have to keep in mind is that we got FDR, governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Germany got Hitler. Italy got Mussolini. These moments, you know, democracy is fragile. It can be stretched, it can be bent. But when people are struggling economically, they're going to be looking for a, a boogeyman, someone to blame. And Hitler knew that and he, and he, and he capitalized on it. And he blamed the, the Jewish people of Germany and look what happened from it. We see strong men come up at this time during when people are struggling economically. They want to blame somebody. And if democracy or American democracy is not a foregone conclusion, it's not inevitable that it will survive. We're lucky in, 19, in the 1930s that we got FDR. Um, 
Germany was one of the smartest, most advanced countries. We just gone through the German philosophical movement with Friedrich Nietzsche, Hegel, Heidegger. They were leaders in physics, uh, atomic physicists, Einstein. And then to see the economy go, and then they become, they make that very direct right turn. And the same thing with Italy and Mussolini. You start thinking back to, oh, we got to regain, uh, we got to isolate, we got to become totalitarian, uh, get rid of democratic institutions, um, political opposition, and just become efficient, self sufficiency in a militaristic sort of way. We didn't do that. We got we got FDR who who will give the New Deal, who will kind of be a huge band aid on the Great Depression. Kind of stops it. It stops it pretty. I mean, we'll drop the unemployment rate at least ten points, ten eleven points. But it's really World War II that gets America out. Next class, we'll look at the New Deal into uh, the. We'll look at the New Deal going into. World War II.